Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Arctic Report Card 2017 press conference. My name is Monica Allen, and I'm from NOAA Communications. And I want to welcome everyone in the room and all those who are joining us today online. We're here today to talk about the NOAA-supported Arctic Report Card, now in its 12th year. The 2017 report card is now available online. You can see the website up there. And we have a video, a very short video, that is on that website. And we welcome you to embed it in your stories, if you like, and share it with, with others. It's very short. It does a nice job summarizing the card. And now I'd like to, it gives me great honor to introduce retired Navy Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet, an acting NOAA administrator, who will kick off this press conference. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Well, all right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a real significant uh, milestone for NOAA right now in releasing the 2017 Arctic Report Card. Uh, because as we state in the report card, we're seeing very, very dramatic changes in uh, the Arctic environment. And um, I want to explain a couple things to you, really, and in, in the bottom line is why, why this is so important and why this matters. Now, the first reason of three I'll, I'll cite is that as you are all Earth scientists for the most part, or, or in some way related to Earth scientists, the Earth is a large system, and so unlike Vegas, what stays in the Arctic doesn't, doesn't stay in the, what, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It, it, it affects the rest of the planet. Uh, it's a connected Earth system that we all study, and so the Arctic has huge, uh, huge influence on other, on global <coughs> systems at large. So it's important from a geophysical science standpoint. Um, but there are two other reasons that are important, and, and they, they directly relate to the priorities of this administration and priorities we've set at NOAA. And that is the huge impact of this information on national security. As my experience in the Arctic as a naval officer attests, the information that NOAA has gathered about the, the Arctic environment is absolutely critical for our naval forces and all our defense forces to operate effectively and safely in that region. Let me share with you a little sea story about that. In 2016, I went up to the north of the Chukchi Sea, uh, and it was in March, and it was cold, and there was a lot of ice. And what I was doing is I was participating in a Navy exercise called ICE-X, and our submarine forces were operating there. We had two submarines. Uh, one surface of the ice, I got to get on board it for a little bit, talk to the submarine captain, and uh, he'd been sailing in the Arctic for decades. And the things he told me were really just quite unbelievable. He said, I have never seen the Arctic in all my time sailing up here underwater uh, as dynamic and, and challenging as it, as, it is, as it is now. He said that the ice is very, it's, it's moving more now because so, it's thin, it's all first year ice. And that's causing these ice ridges to develop and they're very dynamic, they move fast, they're basically underwater ice mountains. So these submarine skippers now have to navigate over shallow terrain, bathymetry, and, and under these ice, this ice terrain that's just bare, moving fast. Quite a hazardous environment, uh, not as, not nowhere near as, it's the most hazardous it's been they've ever reported. So, then combine that with new oceanography processes that we're seeing. There, there's this new kind of what they call duct uh, of, of, um, of, of water, a lens from the, from the Beaufort Sea that's creating extended uh, sound propagation conditions. So what's happening is our adversaries up there can see us better, us being our submarine forces, and that's not a good thing. So the whole exercise was dedicated to what we call tact dev, tactical development, trying to operate better than our adversaries up there, knowing there's these new features. So from a national security standpoint, this information is absolutely critical to enable our forces to maintain their competitive advantage, which is a top priority for the administration here today. But there's another reason why this is important, and that is uh, economic security. The uh, information in the Arctic Report Card is, is essential to managing um, the risk and opportunities that changing Arctic provide. Uh, we're seeing the North Slope residents having to evacuate more and more because of less ice kind of protecting the seashore up in the north and therefore causing more erosion. So some communities have had to be totally evacuated. Most of you all are Arctic people and you, you've probably been following this for, a, for several years. So that's a dramatic change and those, those impacts are negative. But there's also potentially positive uh, impacts in that uh, Russia is looking at the, the, grow, the extended growing seasons and they want to make some money off this. And that's why they've opened the Northern Sea Route to commercial shipping and they look at the whole Arctic change as an opportunity for economic growth. And so our information will help basically inform both of those as, as uh, we as a nation approach this changing Arctic. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I thank you for coming here and supporting NOAA's release of this very important uh, report. And I will now introduce 
the real stars of the show, and that's Dr. Jeremy Mathis, our Arctic Research Program Director. Thank you very much, Admiral. Well, thanks for those great remarks, Admiral, and thanks for the introduction. It makes our job a lot easier. NOAA and our partner scientists from around the world have been tracking the Arctic and putting out the annual peer-reviewed Arctic report card for the last 12 years. I'm really proud to say that this year's report card represents the work of 85 scientists from 12 different countries. Our motivation for the Arctic report card every year and the reason that I'm so excited to be here with you today is that we want every single American to know that the changes that are happening in the Arctic will not stay in the Arctic. These changes will impact all of our lives. They will mean living with more extreme weather events, paying higher food prices, and dealing with the impacts of climate refugees. When we compare 2017 to the unprecedented record-breaking warming that we observed in 2016, there were fewer anomalies this year. But this year's observations confirm that the Arctic shows no signs of returning to the reliably frozen state that it was in just a decade ago. Arctic temperatures continue to increase at double the rate of global averages, and I want to repeat that. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. While our understanding of what is driving these changes gets clearer, we need to expand and improve our understanding and our observations of the Arctic to provide actionable information and forecasting so desperately needed by Arctic peoples and other stakeholders so that they can prepare for and deal with the rapid change that is occurring. Now we're going to take you through a summary of the 2017 Arctic Report Card. First up will be my colleague, Dr. Emily Osborne, a NOAA Canal Sea Grant Fellow who's been working for the Arctic Research Program this year. Emily? Thank you, Jeremy. In 2017, average annual air temperature in the Arctic was the second highest on record, with 2016 being the warmest year on the observational period from 1900 to present. The average temperature in 2017 was 2.9 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1.6 degrees Celsius, above the long-term average measured between 1981 and 2010. Our slides aren't going. Record Arctic temperatures in 2016 were followed by the lowest recorded sea ice winter maximum since the satellite record began in 1979. The following summer months were somewhat cooler, leading to the minimum sea ice extent being ranked eighth lowest on record. Despite being ranked eighth, in 2017, the ice extent was still only slightly greater than the minimum that was observed in 2016. Reflecting on the historical record, 10 of the lowest sea ice minima have occurred in the last 11 years. Not only is there significantly less ice in the Arctic, but the remaining ice is much younger and fragiler and is more prone to melting. One-year-old ice made up 79% of the 2017 ice extent in the Arctic, while the thicker multi-year ice covered only 21%. To put this into a historical context, multi-year ice accounted for an estimated 45% of ice cover in 1985, which is double the amount observed in 2017. An important effect of Arctic sea ice loss is rising ocean temperatures. As the sea ice continues to retreat, previously ice-covered water now absorbs sunlight energy. Unlike the white surfaces of ice, which reflect sunlight, the dark ocean is now absorbing more of the sun's heat. Because of this, sea surface temperature is rising throughout much of the Arctic Ocean. In August of 2017, sea surface temperature was 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, or 4 degrees Celsius higher, than the 1982 to 2010 average in the Barents and Chukchi Seas. The Chukchi Sea, located off the northwestern Alaskan coast, has shown the greatest regional warming trend, with surface ocean temperatures increasing about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit, or 0.7 degrees Celsius, per decade over the last 35 years. In addition to relatively warm regional air temperatures, an increase in the delivery of warmer waters from the North Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are also contributing to warming in the Arctic Ocean. This year, I co-authored a guest essay in the 2017 report card that offers a historical perspective on changes in Arctic Ocean temperature and sea ice extent recorded in the geologic record. 
This essay reports on a body of paleoclimate studies, including a high resolution historical reconstruction of atmospheric temperature and sea ice extent spanning the last 1500 years. This data set shows that the magnitude and sustained rate of warming of the sea ice decline in the 21st century is unprecedented over the last 1500 years and likely longer. Now I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Steph Stephanie Zador, a fisheries biologist with NOAA's Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Thank you, Emily, and good morning. Springtime melting and earlier retreat of sea ice uh, allowed for more sunlight to reach the upper layers of the Arctic Ocean in 2017, stimulating increased blooms of algae and other tiny marine plants that form the base of the marine food chain. But in the Eastern Bering Sea, early ice retreat usually means a less productive ecosystem that year. I worked with fellow NOAA fisheries biologists to contribute a chapter to the report on groundfish fisheries in the Eastern Bering Sea. These valuable fisheries account for 40% of all fish landed in U.S. waters. In fact, pollock, the classic fish that's used in fish sticks, is in some years the world's largest single species fishery, valued at about $433 million annually. Scientific research is showing us that the sea ice does influence the food web that supports pollock and other ground fish. Sea ice does this by contributing to the formation of a pool of cold water that sits on the eastern Bering Sea shelf bottom during summer, and it varies in size from year to year. You can see some contrast in these slides between 2012, which had extensive sea ice, and 2016, which had very little. In years with more extensive cold pools during the summer, we see larger phytoplankton, more krill, and larger copepods. These are the tiny marine species at the base of the food web that provide energy-rich prey to fish predators. While the ground fish stocks in the Eastern Bering Sea are healthy at present overall, a recent string of warm years is playing a role in setting the, pollock, uh, the size of the pollock quota that fisheries managers set and fisheries managers do rely on ecosystem science to set these quotas that are designed to sustain these valuable fisheries over the long term. Now I'll turn this over to Dr. Vladimir Romanovsky of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> so um, turning to Oh, it's, it's already turned. Uh, turning our attention to the land, uh, the Eurasian part of the Arctic experienced above average snow cover for the first time since 2005. However, the North American Arctic experienced below average snow cover extent and earlier snow melt for the 11th of the past 12 years. On the Greenland ice sheet, the second largest ice body in the world. Melting began early in 2017, but slowed down during a cooler than normal summer. This resulted in below average melting uh, when compared to the previous nine years. Despite this, the Greenland ice sheet, a major contributor to sea level rise, uh, continued to lose mass uh, this past year as it has since 2002 when measurement began. Uh, tundra greenness, a measure of vegetative growth <clears throat> observed by satellites, expanded across the Arctic in 2015 and 2016, our most recent years of complete data. Examining the overall trend for the last three decades shows the greatest increases in tundra vegetation are occurring on the north slope of Alaska, Canadian tundra, and Taimur Peninsula of Siberia. Warming air temperatures in the Arctic are causing normally frozen ground called permafrost to thaw. This is the subject of a chapter I contributed to the card this year. So in 2016, the latest year on, of complete records, the majority of Arctic observational sites reported the highest permafrost temperatures on record. 
Permafrost temperatures have been increasing since the 1980s, with the greatest increases recorded in the Alaskan and Canadian Arctic and Svalbard. Warming permafrost is having profound effect on communities where houses are sinking, roads are collapsing, and other infrastructure is being severely damaged. The other significant effect is that as permafrost thaws, it gives off greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane. And now I turn back to Jeremy. Thank you very much, Vladimir. And I want to thank all the panelists for the outstanding comments and the summary that they gave us here this morning. As usual, the Arctic Report Card covers far more than we were able to present here today. But I want to leave you with a high-level summation of how the persistent warming trends are clearly evident in the Arctic landscape. Many of these changes are creating major impacts in the Arctic and have the, pit, uh, the potential to affect people well beyond the region. The Arctic has traditionally been the refrigerator of the planet, but the door to that refrigerator has been left open and the cold is spilling out, cascading throughout the northern hemisphere. The two most significant issues that are likely to cause major effects to Americans and people around the world are melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the warming of the atmosphere and the ocean in the Arctic. Greenland ice sheet melting has the potential to trigger catastrophic sea level rise, while the overall warming that is occurring in the Arctic can disrupt the jet stream, which drives our weather patterns and contributes to extreme weather events. The Arctic is going through the most unprecedented transition in human history, and we need better observations to understand and predict how these changes will impact everyone, not just the people of the North. Before we close, I'd like to thank everyone who made this year's Arctic Report Card possible. We had dozens of authors and contributors who have worked for a number of years and who continue to volunteer their time. We have leaders throughout the U.S. government agencies and in our universities, and many of them are here with us today. And I'd like to take a moment to ask any author or contributor that's in the audience here with us to please raise your hand. So you can see, even in this room, uh, we have quite an, an impressive collection of Arctic scientists. And after the press conference is over today, I would encourage you uh, to reach out and talk to them specifically for their specific area that they worked on. And with that, I'd like to open it up now and be happy to take any questions that you have. But thank you. Okay. We're going to open it up for questions. Just a quick reminder that only registered reporters uh, may ask questions. And please state your name and affiliation. Seth Borenstein, the Associated Press for Vladimir. Uh, on the permafrost, I know the latest data is only 2016. Do you have any preliminary data for 2017? Do you, how can we, since everything else in the report card is 2017, what can you tell us about permafrost in 2017? And in terms of the rate of thawing, can you give us a sense of how the rate has changed from the last 5, 10, 15 years? of the thawing and, and how much, you know, you said it's the majority of permafrost uh, sites. Can you give mm -hmm. us a sense of how much, you know, sort of land mass of thawing and you know, over the, and mm -hmm. I assume it's only over the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Um, I can spend lots of time answering it, but <laughs> I'll try to, to make it short. Um, so first of all, uh, 2017. Uh, yes, uh, we already collected our data from North America. We are still waiting for some uh, data from uh, other countries, but um, it's uh, pretty much um, continuous. Uh, the warming of permafrost uh, still continue in uh, 2017 on the North Slope. It was again the warmest for all sites, what we have, uh, um, and also in interior of Alaska. So the warming is continuous, so it's, it's, uh, there is no interruption, and it seems like this, we, uh, this year, uh, which will go into 2018, it could be even warmer, because so far we still have rain in Fairbanks. It's raining. It's supposed to be minus 30, but now it's just plus 25 or something. So now, uh, in terms of uh, rate of uh, warming and thawing, um, so the rate is, of course, it's, it's a, a variable in, in time. So it's not continuous, it's not linear. Uh, right now, we see acceleration of warming in, uh, in warmer permafrost, which uh, for the last maybe 
uh, 10, 15 years was not warming uh, too much. Uh, but now you see that uh, for, for the last four years, it start to get warmer and I have some, my presentation if it's new wave of warming in the warm permafrost. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, something new which we probably will report on, uh, on next year. Um, now, in uh, terms of um, uh, two, two things that about rate of thawing, it's pretty slow. So permafrost is much more inertial system than, say, sea ice. It's much more inertial, so it takes much longer for permafrost to thaw. Uh, and uh, um, at this point, right now, uh, the thawing of permafrost happening only in some some uh, special locations, so it's not widespread yet. However, <clears throat> if this trend of warming will continue, the widespread of permafrost thawing will start in warmer permafrost, like interior Alaska, for example, in the next 10, 15 years. And even north slope of Alaska, which uh, everybody think about permafrost is pretty stable, uh, it can start to thaw it within maybe 50 years, 50 years from now. Uh, so the rate of warming, uh, the rate of thawing is slow. However, uh, as soon as permafrost start to thaw, uh, that will be a uh, visual impact on infrastructure and ecosystem because most of the ice and permafrost in the upper part. So if just first few meters of permafrost will thaw, it will produce very, very significant impact on uh, infrastructure and on, on ecosystems. And now how widespread it is, it's pretty much all uh, Northern Hemisphere. So there is no difference, uh, too much difference between say um, Alaskan uh, behavior of permafrost and Canadian, especially Northwest of Canada. It's pretty much the same, very, very similar behavior. And also very similar processes going on in Russia as well. And we have uh, data to, well, to Conf to confirm this. So it's pretty much uh, all Northern Hemisphere uh, problem. Thank you. Uh, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS at the American Geophysical Union. I have a question for the Admiral. Um, <laughs> Admiral, you mentioned uh, that the report card directly relates to the priorities of this administration. So I'd like to ask you, what are the one or two top actions that you would like this administration to take in response to the report card? And given the administration's overall stance on climate change, including its plan to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, what level of confidence and why should the public have that such actions might be taken? Sure, uh, I can tell you that NOAA, speaking as a NOAA deputy, uh, is taking action already in terms of uh, advancing our Earth system prediction and model and observation capability. So that's going to allow us to better inform uh, the, this, the, the public and the administration on the changing Arctic and the, and the various departments that depend upon it. Every department within the government depends upon this information. I cited my national security experience, but every department, like the Commerce Department, the Agricultural Department, they depend upon this information. So NOAA is already taking action by advancing our observation and our modeling capabilities. And your second question, I didn't quite capture. The, the second part is, given the administration's overall stance on climate change, including its plan to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, what level of confidence and why should the public have that the administration will take actions? So I can speak as the Deputy NOAA Administrator, and we maintain our climate monitoring and prediction mission and capability, which continues, and we use that to inform the public. And the public, citing the, the state of the Arctic report card as an example, should have high confidence in us, NOAA, and the administration, because we are continuing to report on changes around the planet and in the Arctic to better inform the public and the government. Okay, I believe we have a question from the chat. Royal Rice from USA Today has a question, uh, which is, what does the latest science say about how the diminishing sea ice in the Arctic might directly impact weather and climate patterns down here in North America? For sure, I'll, I'll take that one. And I would encourage you to talk to the gentleman right behind you after the press conference over. Dr. Jim Overland is one of our world experts on this field. 
But what I can say is we're seeing from model results and from some now some limited observations that there are some connections between uh, the warming and the loss of sea ice in the Arctic and the propagation of extreme weather events that we're, we're having across North America. We obviously have a lot more work to do and we need better observations to constrain the models that we're running right now because there is still uh, a, a great deal of disagreement in how those impacts are being propagated through the system. But we're fairly confident now that something's going on in the Arctic, that the warming that's occurring and the loss of sea ice that's occurring are creating conditions where more extreme weather events are beginning to, to show up in, in North America because of that. Okay, do we have another question from reporters in the room? Do we have any more? Is that it? Do we have any more questions on the web chat? No? Any other questions? Oh, Seth? I was going to say, if, there, if there's time. For uh, Stephanie, you talked about Pollock as you know, one of the most important, and, and maybe I, I'm confused. Is Pollock in trouble because of Arctic, or is it not in trouble? I, I was a little confused here. It, are the changes in the Arctic, af how are the changes in the Arctic affecting Pollock? Is, is it, I mean, are we seeing less Pollock because of it? Are we seeing more Pollock? I, I, forgive me for not quite getting that. It's on? Oh, now it's on. Um, so fisheries managers stay on top of uh, pollock stock and changes in pollock stock because partly it's such a valuable fishery. And, um, and it naturally does fluctuate a little bit. And part of that is related to year-to-year -year ecosystem productivity, which is what I was describing. So recently, because of the warm years that we had in 2014, 15, and 16, some of aspects of the ecosystem made it look like, well, you know, maybe we should be slightly a little more conservative in terms of the pollock quota because we're seeing these signs in the ecosystem. And that's happened a number of times, and it's just part of the process of managing it in a sustainable fashion. And so it's not, it's, um, you know, it's a very healthy stock, and we're planning on it being around for a long time. But we do consider the ecosystem when we inform the managers who, who set quotas. So you didn't see drops in numbers. This is just sort of repetitive. Uh, there were slight drops in numbers uh, recently. And there had been, previous to that, in some successive cold years, large increases in numbers. There's caps on how much fishing can be done in the Eastern Bering Sea, so that always limits the amount of total removals to two million metric tons, of which pollock is a large proportion. But year to year, the stock quota varies a little due to just some, some changes, some fluxes in the stock. Yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions from our reporters in the room? Oh, um, Mark Fischetti of Scientific American. I also have a quick question for the Admiral. Um, you mentioned sea ice cover and submarines as sort of an obvious defense um, point of view for why you're interested in the Arctic. I wonder if there are any other defense concerns uh, that you've got. There are a lot of them, and I could probably take the full session talking about them. Yeah, and those are only the unclassified ones. Uh, one example would be our airborne early warning sites uh, that's on, that sit on Alaskan ground and the permafrost under them is causing structural uh, deficiencies. And so th that's a major recapitalization effort that the Air Force is exploring. I don't know the exact status of them, but that, that's one concern. Uh, so our, our facilities and the status of our, our, I mean, our national defense facilities are one. Um, and then there are, uh, uh, the oceanography part that I talked to was something that was cl close to me. And that was, so it's very important for, for NOAA to continue its advances in, in understanding uh, the ocean and the atmosphere in the Arctic and predicting it better uh, so to allow our operating forces to better uh, plan and conduct operations in there safely and effectively. Yeah, um, uh, Rolf Hutt, Dutch News Radio. I, gotta, I wanna get back on the relation with weather um, and ice extent. Um, you mentioned that you see some preliminary um, relations between increased extreme events. Now, extreme events is a really broad category. Could you specify what type of extreme events you do and don't see those correlations with? Yes, in a very general respect, because we can't 
say that any one extreme weather event is in some way related to a, a broader climate change. But when we see uh, unusual cold events, um, unusual drought events out in the West, uh, or even uh, storm systems down along the Gulf Coast, we're starting to see the teleconnections that those have to the Arctic. And I use the analogy of leaving the refrigerator door open and letting the cold air spill out. And this is something that uh, a very general idea of the process that we've been thinking about is when the broader climate system opens the door to the Arctic and allows that cold air to spill out, it's coming down and it's propagating over the northern hemisphere. And that's why we use that analogy is that the Arctic itself isn't driving big climate change and big weather changes over North America. The conditions are setting up such that when those doors do open and that cold air is able to spill out because of the imbalances that are now occurring in the jet stream and due to the fact that the Arctic is warming at this really unprecedented rate, especially when you compare that to global temperature averages that have occurred. So we clearly see that there is a connection out there, refining it uh, and better understanding it so that we can attribute it to specific weather and climate trends is, is something that we'll be working on over the next few years. Hi, I'm Andrew Friedman with Mashable. Um, this is the 12th year now that you guys have done this report card. Um, I'm just wondering over the course of those 12 years, uh, what you have seen that, like how you would characterize the rapid rate of change, the increase in your knowledge of this region and how much uh, concern you have and, you know, knowledge gaps we still have up there um, now that we have more than a decade of doing this, uh, this uh, equivalent of a physical exam of the Arctic region? Sure. Well, I'll tell you from just a personal standpoint, I started going to the Arctic in 2003. So in my mind, that wasn't that long ago. But it's a remarkably different place than it is today. Uh, it, it's really unquestionable how much the Arctic has changed in just that short amount of time. It looks like an entirely different environment. When I was there in 2003, uh, we were breaking very heavy ice, multi-year ice. There were places that we couldn't go, uh, that we couldn't get to because the ice was so thick. I was up there three months ago uh, on a Coast Guard icebreaker, the Healy, and there was no ice to be found. Uh, so it, it's truly dynamic and, and it's an amazing thing to go and see. From the standpoint of putting that in a, in a bigger context, I think the essay that Dr. Osborne wrote with her colleagues uh, about the paleo record really fits that into a broader perspective. Not only is the Arctic changing, the rate of change is unprecedented in at least the past 1,500 years and probably going back even further than that. So not only are we seeing big changes, we're seeing the pace of that change begin to increase. Our gaps, I think we have many gaps in the Arctic. It's one of the most underobserved places on the planet. And that's a legacy uh, of it really not being uh, an area that had a lot of geostrategic importance or a lot of national security importance up into about a decade ago. Now there's this great imperative that's starting to emerge, whether we're dealing with things like increased commercial shipping or whether we're dealing with climate refugees or whether we're dealing with this new open ocean that's going to have to be dealt with from a national security standpoint, there is an emergent and a really urgent need to increase our observational capacity and use those observations to better validate our predictive capabilities. Because if you're a mariner that's sailing through the Arctic, if you're a, a native uh, resident who's using the Arctic for your subsistence lifestyle, uh, or whether you're a tourist on the Crystal Serenity cruise ship that's transiting through, you need good weather forecasts, you need good sea ice forecasts to be able to go up there and, and be safe. So I, I think that's a, a long answer to your question, but there have been big changes, and because of those big changes, we need to think very carefully about how we can address our gaps uh, that we're dealing with right now in the region. Uh, uh, Seth Borenstein, Associated Press. For Admiral Gallaudet, um, not to put, well, to put you even more on the spot uh, following up Randy's question, you, um, Jeremy and, and people at NOAA have been doing this for a dozen years, telling scientists who already know this. President, uh, former President Obama was up in the Arctic 
John Kerry was up in the Arctic, Ronald Reagan was in the Arctic. Uh, is there any effort, or uh, can you tell us what NOAA is doing to not tell the public, but perhaps the White House or leaders in, in this administration about the issue, what you're telling us about the Arctic? Does, has the president or the vice president or, or, or General Kelly, anyone in the White House been told, given this report? Has, ha, is there any efforts to bring them to the Arctic? Uh, because they often are denying what's happening in the Arctic. Uh, I, I know that's uh, putting you on the spot, but is, it, you know, is this just going to the public or is it going up further up, your ch up the food chain there? So Seth, I sat in the second row for a reason. <laughs> no, I went to a White House meeting maybe two or three weeks ago conveyed by uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy on just this report and other actions that the interagency Arctic Research, uh, I think it's Program Committee, Pol Policy Committee, Policy Committee thank you, uh, was uh, addressing. So the White House is addressing it and acknowledging it and factoring it into their agenda. Are there any questions on the chat? No. Any more questions from reporters in the room? Hey, um, this is Brian Resnick from Vox.com. Uh, Emily, when you were g showing us the slide with the um, Arctic sea ice extent over the last, I think it was like 1,200 years, can you explain a little bit more of how uh, you made those assumptions of what the sea ice extent had been, you know, a thousand years ago, and how can we compare that to now? Sure. Is this on? Yeah. Um, so that particular study, um, what it's based on is actually a, a number of records from around the Arctic. So I think uh, it was 45 records. And those records are from lake sediments, they're from ice cores, they're from tree rings. And what's unique about those kinds of records is that we can really, as paleoclimatologists, hone in on what's happening on an annual basis with those kind of archives. And those archives really expand back to roughly around 1,500 years, which was the time that that record particularly ended. Not because anything happened at 1,500 years, but just because that's the duration where we can really say on an annual basis, this is what the variability in sea ice is. And so in compiling all 45 of those records, that curve was generated. And what that curve shows is that over that interval, um, there is some natural variability in sea ice because it is normal for sea ice to vary from year to year. Um, so there are some climate events. There's a medieval climate warm period where you see this slight decline in ice. Um, but when you really move forward into this modern time period in the last couple of decades, what you see is that the magnitude of the decline that's happened in this observational period that the Arctic report card typically reports on is really unprecedented in that period of time, where we can confidently say with the resolution of those records that we haven't observed that magnitude of change and the sustained rate of change in sea ice extent in the Arctic. Do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Michael Tennyson, uh, Simon & Schuster, and uh, I've been talking to scientists who say that the uh, rate of uh, uh, melting has uh, rapidly uh, speeded up since the 90s. And uh, what, it, I mean, and you yourself said since two, 2003, um, what, what it, why the change so fast? Are we pumping more uh, CO2 into the uh, atmosphere, or what, 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 ca what changes on the ground have precipitated these changes in the Arctic? Sure, well, we're clearly pumping more carbon dioxide into the air, but that's been a fairly constant rate, and so we, we don't think that was the, the major driver of the abrupt change. What we think it's related to is something called the Arctic amplification, or what I've been calling the darkening of the Arctic. As sea ice melts, as glaciers melt, as snow cover melts, it turns a highly reflective surface into a surface that's darker and absorbs more heat from the sun. And so it looks like that Arctic amplification really started to kick in and it creates a feedback loop that when more ice and more snow melts, more heat is absorbed, which melts more snow and more ice, which allows more heat to be absorbed. So that seems to be an, an almost runaway effect that's starting to happen now 
which has led to the rapid acceleration of warming that's happened in the Arctic since the 90s. And, and we're seeing that trend continue, honestly. When we lose uh, the amount of sea ice that we lose in the summer with the pullback uh, of the glaciers, that, that reflection, uh, that great service that the Arctic has done to the planet by reflecting that heat back into space is now being uh, absorbed and, and trapped in the environment. So that's one of the main drivers why we think this rapid acceleration of warming and the rapid change in the environment has happened since the 90s is the, Ar the Arctic amplification effect. Do we have any more questions from our reporters in the room? Yeah. Oh, we <coughs> Bud Ward with the Yale Climate Connections. I'd like to follow up on Seth's and Randy's question. Uh, we saw a few weeks ago when NOAA was involved in release of the phase one report of the National Climate Assessment that the critics basically said it's a report of a previous administration hangovers, uh, just, just agency scientists and so forth. Uh, NOAA still doesn't have a nominated and confirmed administrator. And I imagine the presses are rolling all over to begin, already to begin debunking this. Why shouldn't this report just be perceived? as a report of just agency scientists and of previous Obama administration uh, uh, officials? For sure, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that this way in that we've been publishing the report for 12 years, so that predates the Obama administration. The scientists that have been working on this report have been doing it uh, well past that 12-year that mark that we've been publishing the report card. So I don't see this uh, as as being a holdover from the previous administration. I see this as being something that's part of NOAA's core mission that we're able to do every year as a service not only to our partners and colleagues in the other agencies, but now from a growing sense uh, as a service to every American that sees the Arctic uh, as a place for opportunity, as well as when we think about dealing with the Arctic as the challenges emerge. So uh, I, I wouldn't characterize it as a, as a holdover report. I would characterize it as uh, something that we do uh, as a service to the agency and, and as something for the American people. Do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Do we have any more questions on the chat? Okay, well, this concludes our press conference. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you all very much. All right. We'll reconvene at 10.